Live from the 607, it's the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour, where we're talking everything going on in the world of sports. Join in the conversation on social media with the hashtag ODPH, because here we go. Welcome to an all-new edition of the ODPH Podcast, better known as the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour. What's happening, everybody? Thank you so much for joining us this week. My name is Ken M. Joining me in studio, as always, you know him. He's the co-host. His name is Padawan J. ODPH listeners, let's ride. Let's ride indeed, Pad. We can even try riding like a NASCAR race that we're going to be talking about a little later in the show. Yo, that was fucking wild. That was insane. Shout out to Mike from the Multiverse of Badness. He sent us that clip. We will be talking about that later in the show because we have a lot to talk about in the land of sports. A lot of headlines are breaking as we are recording, so we definitely want to get into the conversations. And we want to keep them going after you hear this podcast. So make sure you swing on over to odphpodcast.com. Join in the conversation on the social media accounts. They're all right there on the front page, along with the T Public Store. So if you want to get some swag, that always helps the show. We definitely appreciate that. You can sign up for the Patreon. It's right there on the front page, too. Shout out to all our amazing patrons as well. They have a separate link there, so you can go find out who they are and support them as well, because they are fantastic people. Parlay Points Block section, always something going on there. The Classified section, which has friends of the show, such as 3FN Podcasts and... Uh, organizational link support and Black Lives Matter voter registration. It's updated daily, so there's a lot of stuff going on there. The uh, directory, which, Pat, how many providers are we on? Uh, 111,000. Sounds about right to me, so we definitely uh, just roll with that. And for anything else that is the ODPH, you can find it at odphpodcast.com. And always remember on social media, use the hashtag ODPHpod. But kicking off the sports edition of the show, we have to recap the week that was in the NFL, and there's only one way to do it, and that's breaking down our locks and leaps. So, Pad, kick us off. Yeah, we're going to start with uh, one of my two locks, and I chose the Philadelphia Eagles to beat the Pittsburgh Steelers, uh, which they did handedly by the final score of 35-13. to uh, Jalen Hurts, 19-28 of 28 for 285 yards passing, four touchdowns, no interceptions. Uh, Kenny Pickett, 25 of 38 for 191 yards passing, no touchdowns, one interception. Uh, on the running side, you had Jalen Warren was your leading rusher for Pittsburgh, six carries, 50 yards, no touchdowns. Miles Sanders was the leading rusher for Philadelphia, uh, nine carries, 78 yards, one touchdown. Uh, and then receiving A.J. Brown, your leading receiver, six catches, 156 yards, three touchdowns. Uh, and then for Pittsburgh, it was Pat uh, Freemuth, uh, four catches, 57 yards, no touchdowns. At the beginning of the season, when we did our breakdown of each division, yes, the NFC least is what we define the NFC East. And now we're starting to eat our words a little bit. A little bit. A little bit because Philadelphia is still undefeated at this time of the year. 7-0, and Jalen Hurts is really making a case, not saying he's going to win outright, Mm -hmm. but a case for MVP because he has electrified this offense. And a couple years ago when he came into the league, we weren't sure exactly how things were going to pan out. Mm -hmm. I mean, let's be honest about it. I know there was talk that he wasn't ready, that he was just going to be a flash in the pan, that was you know going to just fade out like most quarterbacks do coming from Alabama. And he has turned it on, and he has definitely kicked it into gear, and he has looked absolutely phenomenal. Oh, he's looked he's looked incredible, and we got to give ourselves a little bit of credit. I pulled up the spreadsheet I, I did for when we were doing our uh, NFL preview show, and you, myself, and Rich all did pick the Eagles to win the NFC East. So hey, kudos to us. Mm-hmm. But I think we I don't think any of us would have predicted that you know the Eagles did this well. To start out the season, the fact that they're sitting at seven and zero, four and zero at home, Hertz is absolutely bawling out of his mind. You know, Christ, I picked the guy up as my backup for the one fantasy league I'm in, just because I had Russell Wilson and I kept Russell Wilson. And then week one, they were like, "Oh, they're you know, Jalen Hurts is projected to have more points than Russell Wilson." You know, and and Hertz is playing Detroit. I'm like, okay, I've started uh, Ross or uh, Jalen Hurts ever since outside of the bye week. And, you know, this year, uh, for up to this point, he's got uh, 1,799 yards passing, 10 touchdowns, two interceptions, and a QBR of 60.7. I mean, is it a little unfair that I had both Jalen Hurts and A.J. Brown on the same team? 
Maybe a little bit. <laughs> Maybe, but you know. I, I had 60 points between the two of them by the end of the first set of games. But you can't argue that, though, because he has really elevated his game. And a lot of that has to do with A.J. Brown being there. Yeah. That obviously they drafted Devontae Smith Lance yeah. last season. Yeah. And he's starting to come into his own. But pairing him with a true number one in A.J. Brown has really elevated his confidence. And definitely he's not afraid to get into shootouts with other teams Mm -hmm. and to see that they were really clicking. And this is the first time that this really jumped out. I mean, obviously putting up 156 yards and three is no laughing matter. Right. But AJ Brown really hit the groove against a Pittsburgh defense that, you know, we weren't sure what we were going to get out of them. Mm -hmm. And it's not anything really good right now that this is not Steelers football on any side of the ball. No. And this is something that they're going to have to deal with moving forward. But for Philadelphia, it's a strong win, a strong statement win. Yeah. And obviously in a very competitive division, which is wild to say. Yeah. I mean, obviously, thinking back to when we did the preview episode of the season, we were all ripping on this division, rightfully so. But we're now eating those words to reiterate. Yeah. They have really stepped up the competition level in the NFC East. And Philadelphia has really made it click because with Hurts on that side of the ball is really setting the pace, and that defense is just getting nasty. Oh, it's insane. And especially they're not afraid to shut down, and, and they're kind of capturing that old Philadelphia defense where they're blitzing mm-hmm. a lot more. They're they're really making sure that they're setting a tempo early, too. Like yeah. That's one thing, too. They're not doing too many second-half adjustments, no. in my opinion, but it's right out the gate. They're setting the pace early. And they're buying their offense enough time to really get the ball rolling. So this is a huge win for them. And obviously, looking at their schedule moving forward, I mean, Philadelphia's got some tougher games coming up. Yeah, well, not for a little bit, you know, because they got the Houston Texans this upcoming Thursday. Uh, that, that's on Amazon Prime Video. Mm-hmm. Uh, then they've got the Washington Commanders. The bum, 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 bum. The Indianapolis Colts and the Green Bay Packers. Uh, then they got the Titans, Giants, Bears, Cowboys, Saints, and Giants to close out the year. Well, when we get to the latter half of the season, too, I mean, the thing is about in division, you never know. Uh-huh. And that's the one thing, too. That's why I say Washington, with how, as bad as they have played this season, they're still going to give them a fight. And for the Giants, that's going to be a very, very interesting matchup, too. Yeah. Because with the Giants, they've been the surprise team of the NFL this season. And to see how they'll really match up against a Philadelphia team that I think is a lot better on both sides of the ball on paper, Mm -hmm. it's going to be a true test to see if the Giants are really playoff worthy or not. Philadelphia has already established that. Yeah, Running 7-0 is no easy feat, and they're doing it very dominantly. They're not afraid to take some shots at some teams. They're really being aggressive, and I like seeing this out of this squad because especially with the backlash that this came with Hurts, that he was really getting written off. Yeah. For a long time. I mean, he's only been drafted since, what, 2020? Something like that, yeah. But now he's really kind of evolved into this quarterback that Philadelphia has desperately needed for the past few seasons. And now, look at the success he's having. Taking a flip to Pittsburgh, though, this season is done. Let's let's be honest. Yeah, I mean, looking at the a- AFC North standings, you've got the Ravens in first place, 5-3. and three, Cincinnati, uh, second place, 4-4. Four and four, Cleveland, third place, 3-5. and five, And then Pittsburgh uh, sitting there at 2-6. and six. And I mean, it's 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 over, done with. Stick a fork in them, but give them their fair due. You know, their upcoming schedule. They are mercifully on a bye week uh, this upcoming Sunday because Lord knows they can use it uh, to fix some of the issues they got. Uh, but then coming out of the bye week, uh, so on Sunday, November thirteenth, they're playing the Saints. Then they have the Bengals, Colts, and then Falcons. Mm. I would say there's some silver lining there, but there really isn't. I mean, Kenny Pickett has to find his way, and obviously he's a rookie. We mm-hmm. we need to remember this. Yeah, he's a rookie with not much else going around him. No, not much. Especially and, after today. <laughs> yeah, I know. There's, <laughs> there's a lot going on with that team right now. But Najee Harris hasn't really kicked into gear either, too, which, I mean, that's something I think that hurts them a lot. Sophomore slump. But it's a sophomore slump, but it's something that defenses are knowing with a rookie quarterback that they're going to rely so heavy on that run game. They're loading up the box, and Pickett is not there yet to where he should be nailing his receivers in stride. Mm -hmm. And that's something with that wide receiver core. They do have the potential to really take off in some games, but they're just not doing it. And that's something that with the rest of the season, Pickett's going to have time to work on it. Right. Next season will be a whole different ball game since he will be the fully established number one starter. Right. 
But for right now, I mean, Pittsburgh's just got to tread water to get to the end. Mm-hmm. That's all they can look forward to. Start thinking about draft picks. Yeah. That's a smart play to do right now. But for Philadelphia, the ball keeps rolling. So congratulations to them staying undefeated. Yeah. Next up. Uh, if we're going to go to one of my leaps, uh, and that was I chose the Los Angeles Rams to beat the San Francisco 49ers, uh, which they did not. San Francisco won by the final score of 31-14. to Jimmy Garoppolo, 21 of 25 for 235 yards passing, two touchdowns, no interceptions. Matthew Stafford, uh, 22 of 33 for 187 yards passing, one touchdown, no interceptions. Ronnie Rivers, your leading rusher for the Rams, one or excuse me, eight carries, 21 yards, no touchdowns. Christian McCaffrey, your leading rusher, 18 kick for San Francisco, 18 carries, 94 yards, one touchdown. Uh, Brandon Ayuk was your leading receiver for San Francisco with six catches, 81 yards, one touchdown. And Cooper Cup led for Los Angeles with eight catches, 79 yards, and one touchdown. We also should note Christian McCaffrey had a receiving touchdown as well as a passing touchdown, becoming the first player in NFL history since 2005, I believe was the stat, to have a passing, rushing, and receiving touchdown all in the same game. He looked phenomenal. This is why the 49ers grabbed him. Yeah. And he is going to help them out if he can stay healthy. That's the one thing that they have to worry about with him. But while he's in there, he's a game changer. And it showed. The Los Angeles Rams, we talk about a Super Bowl slump. Mm -hmm. They look lost out there. Yeah, they do. And even with three wins, they still have a lot of talent on both sides of the ball. They're just not making it happen. Matthew Stafford, I'm fully convinced, has really got some arm problems. I, th- I think it's an ongoing thing just because they said, it, I forget what exactly it was, but it was something with, like, both sides of his elbow. Yeah. You know, which they're like, oh, this is really tough to come back from. And clearly it's showing that obviously he can go. But then again, you know, he did throw a game-winning touchdown pass with a dislocated shoulder. You know, so he's he's a gamer. He'll go out and ball for you. But, like, clearly it's just a little too much for him, and I don't know what the solution is. But, yeah, you're right. It's ugly. What I would do if I was the Rams, and obviously looking at their standings in that NFC West, you, when you are eliminated from the playoffs or if you don't think it's going to happen, I deactivate him and tell him to go get surgery and get back for next season. Looking at the standings for the NFC West, Seattle is in first place, record of five and three. San Francisco is in second place, record of four and four. The Rams are in third with a record of three and four. Uh, and then you've got the Cardinals in last with a record of three and five. Looking at the playoff standings, let's see. Uh, they are currently the number nine seed uh, ahead of the likes of Tampa Bay, Green Bay, and Arizona. Never thought I'd be saying that this time of the season, huh? Oh, yeah. But this is a situation that the Rams are going to have to watch moving forward because with Stafford not performing as well, obviously it's an arm issue. It's not him. I mean, he has been in this league long enough. He's not getting a lot of protection from that offensive line. Like, there's been a significant drop-off from last year. And I don't know how many other times they've changed it since, but I remember watching their game a couple of weeks ago when they were playing uh, Dallas. Mm -hmm. And that was one thing the broadcast brought up, was that, like, they had gone with, like, the fourth or fifth different offensive lineman lineup. Like, the, the configuration and just, like, who was at what position. They'd gone with, like three or four of them in like four or five weeks or something, which is just not a recipe for success, you know, when it comes to protecting the quarterback because, you know, you need that familiarity and that experience at a given position. And when you're bouncing guys back and forth between different positions, it's going to kind of hamper you. Uh, Looking at his stats for this year, he's got 1,763 yards, good for 14th in the NFL, seven touchdowns tied for 22nd in the NFL, eight interceptions, which is tied for 33rd in the NFL, uh, and a QBR of 48.3, which is good for 18th in the NFL. Yeah. So it's a situation for the Rams. you got to make a call. I know that it's not popular to say sit him, but if he's if he's going to be your quarterback for the next few years, protect him now. I mean, they could still make a run to the playoffs. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, they, they could always mess around, uh, mess around and get there. But I don't see them really making a deep run this year. I think their offensive line is too banged up. Well, and it doesn't it doesn't help that Cooper Cup had his injury scare or whatever it was on mm-hmm. Sunday with the ankle. I mean, looking at their the injury report, he was listed as questionable uh, yesterday as we record. Uh, with quote, Co- Coach Sean McVay indicated Monday that he expects Cup ankle to play this coming Sunday against the Buccaneers. Uh, Jordan Rodrigue of the Atlantic reports close quote. Yeah, it's a really really questionable time right now yeah and i think that they're gonna have to really make some tough calls 
about the status of their team. But if they lose another game, you'd almost have to think that you have to really give us some more serious concern about Stafford and who you got to start sitting. Right. I know it's still early, and you can say, well, they could still make a run through the playoffs. If they're still underproducing and Stafford's looking as bad as he is, you're not going to get anywhere anyway. I'm looking at their schedule. If they expect to make a run, to quote Bon Jovi, they're going to be living on a prayer. Yeah. Uh, because I'm looking at their schedule. So this upcoming week, they're playing the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, which coin flip these days. Mm-hmm. The, after that, they've got the Arizona Cardinals. Again, coin flip because it's divisional. Right. New Orleans Saints, which you would think they'd beat you, but the way New Orleans is playing lately, who knows? Uh, then you've got the Kansas City Chiefs. Yeah. Seattle <laughs> Seattle Seahawks. Hey. With you know the Wolverine that is DK Metcalf seemingly not hurt at all, despite getting carted off last week. Right. What the fuck? Yeah. Study that man for science. Uh, then you've got the Las Vegas Raiders the week after that. Then you've got the Green Bay Packers, Denver Broncos. That's uh, right. The Chargers and then the Seahawks to close out the year. <sighs> It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy. So that's why I say if they can't put it together right away, I don't think they're going to get there. But I honestly don't see them surpassing the 49ers. This is the team that we've been waiting to see out of the 49ers. That with Garoppolo at the helm, they're playing very solid. But you now have certified playmakers making plays. McCaffrey looked great. Yeah. And he definitely got everybody involved in the game. Like I said, throwing Ayuk. Really helped matters. He was he had a really strong game too. Yeah, he did. Which I think he he flies under the radar a lot. I mean, obviously Debo Samuel was not in, and they still were putting up thirty one points. But that defense was playing yeah. lights out too. Though. Yeah, McCaffrey looked great. I mean, this looked like the Christian McCaffrey. Every person the last three or four years has drafted him in the first round in their fantasy draft expected him to be myself included Mm -hmm. you know he has not looked like this in quite some time now whether it's a change of scenery oh i think so you know he prefers that california sunshine as opposed to the carolina sunshine you know maybe you know whether it's just a different offense that plays better to his abilities maybe you know but he is i expected him to do well but i figured it would have taken longer than two weeks i think that it is a change of scenery because if you're around a culture of losing yeah, and you're now thrown into a possibility of really making a playoff run. I mean, let's yeah. face it, Carolina has not been Carolina for a while since what they went to the Super Bowl a couple of the two times. Yeah, when Cam Newton was at the home. Cam Newton was at the home, and then uh, when they played against the Patriots. Well, and... it was Jake Delone, but that was before the. Yeah, that's true. That was a long time ago. But this is a situation that you have to look at. Carolina has not been a really good team, a playoff worthy team since Cam for some for quite some time. Yeah. So now you have him in a situation where he is on the cusp of making a run and he's not relied on to be the the center of attention. I was just going to say he doesn't have to be the guy. He's just a guy. Yeah, because when you have George Kittle in that lineup, when Samuel's healthy and he's in there, that's that's a definite bonus. It's a weird situation to say, but McCaffrey doesn't need to be the number one. He just needs to, to, you know, plug and play, as we like to say with wrestling. In spots where they need him, yeah. but he's not relied to be that that heavy workload guy. So now teams are trying to strategize. Okay, who do I beat? Who do I do what? Who do I wear? This is where the 49ers are going to thrive at because they play very selfless football. That Garoppolo does not care who he throws to. He just has to get the ball out of his hands. If that mm-hmm. line holds up, he's going to do it. He's going to bore you to sleep. I'm not talking Indianapolis boring, right? But he's going to bore you. And he can definitely put on some points if that defense also holds up their, their end of the bargain, too. And they are very, very deceptive as well. Like, that's the one thing that people need to realize here, that the 49ers' defense is a very, very good defense. Mm-hmm. But you can't really name too many people on that defense because yeah. they really fly under the radar. But that's something that John Lynch has done as GM here that has really carried on throughout the years. Now, if they can just get some steady offensive play, they're going to be a team that's going to be scary in that playoffs. Mm-hmm. And looking at their schedule moving forward, Pad, I think they can definitely make a run. Yeah, so they got a bye week this upcoming week. Uh, after that, they come back and they play the Los Angeles Chargers. So then they've got the Arizona Cardinals, the New Orleans Saints, Miami Dolphins, Tampa Bay Buccaneers, Seattle Seahawks, Washington Commanders, uh, the Las Vegas Raiders, and then the Arizona Cardinals to close out the season. Yeah, so, I mean, anything is possible there, but i got to say, you really have to like your chances here with the 49ers moving yeah. forward. Oh, absolutely. I, I definitely got to say, they're going to be a team that when they get in there, and notice how I said when, they're going to make some noise. Now, it just depends on how far they want to go 
So if they can really make a run, everybody stays healthy, just, you know, right timing needs to happen here and right yeah. luck needs to happen too. Yeah. They could make a run. Now, am I going to say they're going to get to the Super Bowl? No, but I'll say this. Weirder shit's happened. I wouldn't doubt them getting there. Yeah. Like if you said that they're in the finals against Philadelphia right now, I'm not saying Philly's going to w- completely run away with that game. No, it'll be, it'll, really be close, it'll be closer than you think. It'll be a lot closer than you think. But that's the beauty of football and the 49ers when they're clicking. It's always fun to watch them play. So let's go flip to my locks and leaps, and obviously I have to talk about the Buffalo Bills. Yes, you do. Because Buffalo had a very highly watched game on Sunday Night Football. Yeah. I believe it's the highest watched game of 21 million viewers. Holy fuck. In like the the past eight years or so. That's that's a lot of people. It's some crazy stat like that, but obviously the Bills have been the talk of the NFL. Not saying this is a homer pick, though. I want to stress this. No, yeah. A lot of people have been picking them. A lot of people have been talking about them, and obviously this has been prime time in upstate New York, and you know the fans are going to get up for it. And obviously when they made this game at the beginning of the season. Yeah. This was supposed to be a really contested game. You know, a generational matchup. You know, the two-time reigning, defending, undisputed, uh, back-to-back NFL MVP and Aaron Rodgers mm. going up against the young, up-and-coming future MVP. Because let's face it, he hadn't won an MVP, but he's going to at some point yeah. in Josh Allen. Yeah. And then when you see all this go down, the game did not go the way that I think everybody was thinking. Those fuckers couldn't score one more point. Oh, my God. I was expecting that to completely happen. But, Pad, read that beautiful st- uh, stat line. So yeah, so the Bills won by the final score of 27-17. to 17. Uh, Josh Allen, 13-25 of 25 for 218 yards passing, two touchdowns, two interceptions. Aaron Rodgers, 19-30 of 30 for 203 yards passing, two touchdowns, one interception. Aaron Jones, your leading rusher for Green Bay with 20 carries for 143 yards and no touchdowns. Uh, Devin, Devin Singletary, your leading rusher for Buffalo with 14 carries for 67 yards, no touchdowns. Stefan Diggs was your leading uh, receiver for Buffalo with six catches for 108 yards, one touchdown. And then Romeo Adobs, or Dupes, uh, was your leading receiver for Green Bay with four catches, 62 yards, and one touchdown. He looked phenomenal, too, I will say, for Green Bay. like That was probably the only upside. Some of the catches he was making was very, very impressive. There was one that he was highly contested. He did like a spin move to catch. Right. Well, and I know that's one of the issues Green Bay's got going is they're a little hurt at their receiving core right now. Yes. Yes, they are. But, man, oh, man, oh, man, Buffalo came in there. I I was very surprised at how quickly they jumped out. But when you saw that Stefan Diggs was arguing coming right out of the tunnel. Saw that. They were ready to make some noise. And obviously, the Bills do have a very strong home field advantage. Yes. It's Bills Mafia. And when they came in, they wanted to set the tempo early. I thought they did. I thought Green Bay's offensive line was really letting Aaron Rodgers down. Mm -hmm. And I thought that some of the early play calling, and Pad, correct me if I'm wrong. Sure. I thought Aaron Rodgers looked frustrated and checked out. Yeah. He's shown that a couple of times this year, I know, with just how things have gone. That, you know, if there was the one game. I don't think it was this one. I think it was the last game last week where he kind of threw his hands up in the air, looked back at his sidelines, and the slow-motion replay, uh, listen, you, you don't have to be a lip-reading expert. Even anyone could figure out what he was saying. Uh, he was saying to his sidelines, quote, what the fuck are we doing? Yeah. You know, and I think the frustration is uh, normally he's a little calm, cool demeanor, obviously, not when he's playing the Bears. Uh, but otherwise, he's kind of like calm, cool, collected. But the frustrations are starting to show themselves in the fact that they're three and five now, you know, and possibly looking at missing the playoffs, which is wild to fucking say. You know, it's it's definitely pissing them off. It's definitely pissing them off. But I think this has been some overtones that we've been knowing about for a few years now that he has a disconnect with that front office. And I think that yeah. we, we've talked about this at length. And I think that it's a safe call to say. This has not gone away. No, and this ain't helping anything. And it's definitely not helping anything because that offensive line did not do any favors for him. And this was just one of the most craziest things to see is him outright frustrated Uh about what happened and him just sitting there going like, what what else can I do? I'm I'm back here. I'm trying to make something happen. I don't have any wide receivers to throw to except, like I say, uh, Romeo Dobbs. He really stepped up, and I thought for being as young as he is, he was definitely trying to do everything he could to help Rodgers out. 
but everybody else on that team was not putting up an impressive stat line. Yeah, I mean, I realize the Green Bay Packers have had a plethora of great w- receivers come through those doorways over the years, but, like, sorry, none of these guys are it. I mean, Romeo Dobbs, uh, Samori Toure, Robert Tunyon, Amari Rogers, Aaron Jones, Christian Watson, Josiah uh, Degura, A.J. Dillon, and Sammy Watkins all received catches on Sunday. And the, I'll be honest, the only two names I really know on there are Aaron Jones and then Sammy Watkins. Yeah, I was kind of surprised to see Sammy. I forgot he was in Green Bay to see him back up there. Listen to this stat line. One target, one catch, three yards. Yep. I, I digress. But for the Bills, though, they looked great. They got the offensive running game going on, too. Uh, Spurs Singletary only got 67 yards by the time it was all said and done. Uh, like I said before, like I'll say again, Buffalo not known for their run game. Yeah, definitely not known for the run game, but they were establishing it. Like I thought, they they were piecing enough together that they were keeping Green Bay at, at bay. But their se- Green Bay secondary is just not good, and the fact that they were getting torched left and right was a very big telling sign that this team is not the team we thought they were going to be. It's going to get more frustrating for Green Bay moving forward. I know we have a lot of Packers fans that listen to this show, and I don't have any nice things to say because unfortunately, I just don't see this team doing anything at this stage. Yeah. I'd, I'd love to see them make a run. I really would. But I don't know if they're going to be able to put it together because the way the Rodgers is looking when he's playing, mm-hmm. he's checked out. Oh, absolutely. Like, that's the biggest thing that I can take away. And, yeah. I, and I think he knows the season's a wash. Oh, yeah. But, I mean, because I'm looking at the standings. Uh, for the NFC North, you have the Minnesota Vikings in first place at 6-1. and one. Green Bay's at second place at 3-5. and five. Chicago's tied right there with them, though, at the same record. And then you've got the Detroit Lions in last place at a record of 1-6. and six. Flipping it over to the playoff standings, however. Playoffs? Playoffs, yeah. Uh, you've got the Green Bay Packers currently in the 11th seed uh, ahead of Arizona, New Orleans, and Chicago. And get ready for this one. They win the tiebreaker over New Orleans and Arizona based on best win percentage in conference games. Division tiebreak was initially used to eliminate Chicago. Green Bay wins the tiebreak over Chicago based on head-to-head win percentage. Hmm. So that's why they're ahead of Chicago. Interesting. But it still doesn't matter. They're not going to get there. Nope. On the flip side, though, Buffalo looked very, very good coming off the bye week. I thought they needed to get this one especially. Not that it was a prime time. And obviously, I do have to make a little correction. It was 21 million viewers, on, but this is the most viewed week eight football game. Oh, uh, okay. In uh since okay. in, in since twenty fifteen, uh according to Dove Kle- or Kleinman. Okay. Who covers the NFL ratings and such. So uh very interesting stat, but it believes it though because they needed this win because next week they face those J E T S Jets, Jets, Jets. Mm-hmm. And I got a little son son about that. Oh, talk to me. So I cannot take credit for this. My brother sent this to me today. Uh, this comes to courtesy of the folks at CBS Sports uh, on Facebook. Uh, there is a person by the name of a Twitter name of Nooner, N O O N E R, and their Twitter handle is at Nooner Nation. Uh, at 1.10 p.m. on August 21st, 2022, they tweeted, quote, just did a coin flip to predict the Jets' season, and this is what happened. Uh, I've got this thing up, and then Ken's got the uh, Jets schedule up, mm-hmm. so we're gonna we're gonna read through this. Week one against the Baltimore Ravens, the coin came up a loss. Ken, what happened? Uh, they lost. Week two against the Cleveland Browns, the coin said they'd win. Ken, what happened? One by one. Uh, week three against Cincinnati, the coin said they'd lose. Twenty-seven to twelve loss. Uh, week four against Pittsburgh, said they'd win. 24-20. Uh, week 5 against Miami, said they'd win. 40-17. to 17. Week 6 against Green Bay, said they'd win. 27-10. Uh, week 7 against Denver, said they'd win. Let's ride, 69. Uh, week 8 against New England, said they'd lose. Took the L, 22-17. to 17. Uh, This upcoming Sunday, says against Buffalo, they're going to win. This, I, this account or this coin's a perfect 8-for-8 eight eight right now. I would say this, I mean, and I mean this very honestly, this is a game the Jets can win. Coming up, like the Bills needed the momentum to go in. Obviously, they're fighting to get first place for the playoffs. They want to get that number one seed because mm-hmm. they don't want to go to Kansas City in any way, shape, or form. I don't either. I don't feel comfortable going down there because too much weird stuff falls in the Chiefs' favor, yeah. in my opinion. It's like when it's like when Brady and the Patriots have to go to Indy to play Manning. Fuck no. Exactly. You Fuck just, no. There's no purpose for it. Like if you can avoid it, there's no purpose. So this is a game they have to watch out for because the one thing is the Jets are going to scrap with them. Oh, yeah. They're really going to test them. They're really going to push them. And this is something that the Bills can't overlook 
They need to go in there and play smart football. I know the Jets are going to be waiting for them, and they're going to hit them very hard. Like This is going to be one of the more physical games you're going to see of the season. Probably. By far, this is going to be one to watch and just be kind of gritting your teeth that everybody comes out healthy because both teams like to hit hard. They're going to be going very, very full throttle about this one. I'm excited for the game. And I'm just hoping the Bills can squeak this one out. Like, I'm just being very optimistic about this because this was a great win against Green Bay, who we thought was going to be a playoff contender, but they weren't. Josh Allen looked fantastic in this. Yeah. Didn't have to leap over anybody, which made me super happy. So hopefully moving forward, we stay on that trajectory, and I'm super excited to see where they wind up going from here. But next week is going to be a tough one, though. Yeah, so like we mentioned, they've got the Jets this upcoming Sunday. After that, they've got the Minnesota Vikings, Cleveland Browns, Detroit Lions, and then the first of two matchups against the Patriots. Yeah, it's not an easy road right now. And I don't care how bad Detroit's been playing lately. Detroit will put up some points. Any given Sunday. Uh, And then on the flip side for Green Bay, they've got the Detroit Lions this upcoming Sunday uh, before they go and play the Dallas Cowboys, Tennessee Titans, and Philadelphia Eagles. Hmm. Well, Green Bay, I don't know what to say. I really don't. There's nothing nice you can say about the season thus far. It's not been good. No. And I wouldn't doubt Aaron Rodgers walks at the end of the season at this stage. He just he he just has the body language he's checked out. That's mm-hmm. the easiest way to describe yeah. that. As for the Bills, they're looking like the Super Bowl contender everybody's talking to them about. I'm just hoping they stay focused and really keep a level head going into next week because I think that this is going to be a real test for them. And obviously, it doesn't get any easier with Minnesota looming in the background, too. No. Because that, that, I wouldn't doubt, gets flexed to Sunday night. I know they haven't talked about that yet. but I think it's at the point where they can start doing that. I could be wrong, though. Yeah, no, they're they're at that stage. So, not saying it's going to happen, but keep your eyes open for that one. So, let's close out the locks and leaps talking about my leap and those New York Giants. Hey. I should have known better. I should have known. Hey. Because. They are who we thought they were. Yeah, they got exposed. Uh, there's no easy way to put it, but the team that exposed them, man, if anybody said Seattle was going to be this good at the beginning of the season with, uh, losing Russell Wilson, I would have said you're absolutely crazy, but Geno Smith, everybody. Well, I mean, this game was close up until the Giants defense forgot that there's four quarters in a football game. True. Uh, because the uh, Seattle Seahawks ended up winning by the final score of 27 to 13. Uh, Geno Smith, 23 of 34 for 212 yards passing, two touchdowns, no interceptions. Uh, Daniel Jones, 17 of 31 for 176 yards passing, no touchdowns or interceptions. Saquon Barkley, your leading rusher for the Giants, uh, 20 carries, 53 yards, one touchdown. Kenneth Walker the third, your leading rusher for Seattle, 18 carries, 51 yards, one touchdown. Tyler Lockett, your uh, leading receiver for uh, the Seahawks with five care catches, 63 yards, one touchdown. Uh, Darius Slayton, your leading receiver for the Giants with five catches, 66 yards, no touchdowns. So, like you touched upon, this was a very winnable game for the Giants, except they forgot about a fourth quarter. Yeah, because, I mean, you look at halftime, it was 10-7 in favor of the Seahawks, and then going into the fourth quarter, it was, doing some math here, 13-10, to you know, after the three quarters. So it's still pretty close and, in, 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 you know, doable. And then the Giants only put up three points in the fourth quarter to the Seattle Seahawks, uh, two touchdowns. It's a tough thing to watch if you're a Giants fan because your team has been overachieving. And the feel of winning has become the norm. Mm -hmm. And Seattle exposed you. And Seattle really went out of their way to set the tempo that they're not a joke. I know that Caleb over Brody uh, Sports Talk, great podcast too, by the way, called this. And he was one of the few people that said Seattle was going to win. And sure enough, they wind up pulling it off. Because Geno Smith is playing above average right now. Oh, absolutely. He's got a chip on his shoulder. He's playing very smart with the football, and this definitely helps. He's, is he going to be putting up Russell Wilson numbers? No. Oh, hell no. But he doesn't need to. Like, Seattle, in a weird sense, is like Indianapolis of a few seasons ago. Yeah. But they have a better receiving core. Yeah, they do. But... They definitely have a boost on that offensive from from Kenneth Walker. Mm -hmm. This guy has really came out of nowhere. Good Lord. And has been the big shock to the system that they need to get going. And if he's running hard, this team is going to be very tough because it takes a lot of pressure off everybody that they're focusing on the defense, which, I mean, DK Metcalf has always gotten double coverage. 
And like you touched on, he's the Wolverine of the NFL. Yeah. Because he carted off last week only to play the full game this Sunday. Yeah, and, and six catches, 55 yards, one touchdown, nothing to sneeze at there. And then Tyler Lockett, too, who is a very unsung hero on that offense as well, mm-hmm. did have a bad game. Like, if you watch that game, dropped a wide-open touchdown. Which he does not do. No, he doesn't. Very often. It's rare that he has it. You know, he'll drop some passes in the field, but when it comes to passes in the end zone, because he worked on that specifically. Because mm-hmm. he had he had a bad drop. It was either early in his NFL career or in his college career. I forget which one it was. But he had a crucial drop that would have won the game for whoever he was playing with, and he vowed to work on that. So him dropping a pass in the end zone is a rarity. Yeah, and he definitely was struggling too. I know that he, he just a couple missed opportunities. Yeah, like he could he could have had a big day on Sunday, but they didn't go away from him. They kept going at him, which I which I say, it's a true sign of a team that if you have faith in a player that you keep going to him about the ball. And he they definitely hit him at the right time too with a great touchdown catch. And when Seattle really got the momentum going, they took advantage of a lot of giant turnovers too. Mm-hmm. The fumble reco- er, recovery was huge, and obviously the special teams for the Giants was struggling all day. Oh, God, it yeah. Was, it was atrocious. I mean, it is what it is. I know, unfortunately, somebody did get it, uh, put into concussion protocol, if I'm not mistaken, Yeah. which, I mean, unfortunately, that does happen. So I'm not saying that's all on that player by any means, but I think what happened is the special teams of the Giants were allowing too many big plays to happen, and Seattle was capitalizing. Like, Seattle is being very smart. Right. And that is something <clears throat> that we were not expecting from them this season. We honestly thought they were going to be very bad. Yeah. And now five and three, almost undefeated at home. They're three and one. Yeah, it's wild. It's huge. Like you want to say this team is going to be sneaking in those playoffs. Well, looking at the standings in the NFC West, they're currently leading the NFC West. Uh, so that puts them at the number three position in the uh, playoffs for the NFC conference. Yeah. Which that's is fucking crazy. Crazy to think about. Uh, and looking at the Seahawks' schedule, they've got the Arizona Cardinals this upcoming Sunday, and then they take on the Tampa Bay Buccaneers in the following week. They've got a bye week in Week 11, and then they come back and play the Las Vegas Raiders uh, in Week 12. On the flip side for the Giants, you have got they have got a bye week this upcoming Sunday, uh, and then they've got, after that, the Houston Texans, Detroit Lions, and then, the, then they start the gauntlet of uh, divisional games, starting with the Dallas Cowboys. Yeah, for the Giants, I think the next couple games are must win. Uh huh. Because, because after those two, one, two, three, four, five divisional games out of the seven. Mm-hmm. And I don't think it's going to get any easier when it's division. Nope, because it's a no matter how good you are, literal coin flip. They should be nine and one, but they're going to be eight and two at their best to go in there. And I don't think that guarantees playoffs. I really don't. No. I think unfortunately Dallas is going to be beating you out there. So you're going to need to sneak in there somehow, some way. Not to say they couldn't sneak in and do it outright, but I just don't see them having that much success against the division, especially with Philadelphia just waiting in the wings, pun intended. Yeah. It's going to be a tough one. So I think for Daniel Jones, he's got to play smarter with the ball. He's definitely got to make a little more plays. And that wide receiver core definitely was trying to make something happen. Yeah. Just Unfortunately, getting down in that red zone, they just were not able to punch it in. And that's something they're going to have to find ways to do and do often if they're going to be taken as a serious contender. But they have to place four solid quarters. Yeah. That's that's the big takeaway from reminders, this one. Reminders, New York Giants, there's four quarters in an NFL football game. Yeah, they need to focus on that moving forward. If they don't, it's going to be a long, long season. And I, don't, and I know it's kind of weird to say, well, it's only two losses. It's going to be something if they yeah. want to be a playoff team. Because it, Any other year... The Giants easily have first place in this division. Mm-hmm. Like, let me let me just even pull up the standings. Uh, so six and two, I'd put them right behind first place in the AFC East. That would put them in first place in the AFC North, first place in the AFC South, first place in the AFC West, for uh, second place in the NFC North, first place in the NFC South, and then first place in the NFC West. So outside of like two divisions in the entire NFL. Six and two would put them in first place in every other division in first place. And likely any other year, first place in the NFC East, but because of just how good Dallas and Philly are playing, well, they're tied for second. It's a weird world, man. But for the Giants, they still can make a run, but they just got to have a lot of luck because I'm telling you, those division games are not going to get any easier. So that said, let's take a quick stop around the rest of the league and give you our thoughts on the rest of the games. Uh, for the Thursday night game, hey, it didn't entirely suck. Uh, you had the Baltimore Ravens beat the, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers 27-22. to 
Baltimore looked impressive. Tom Brady looks like he's falling off. Tom uh, Brady's old. I don't care if he's about to pass 100,000 yards passing. He's old. Enough said. Uh, you had the New England Patriots beat the uh, New York Jets 22-17. to Patriots did Patriots things. Yes, they did. Jets are starting to come back to earth a little bit. I think they're going to play with a little chip on their shoulder going into next week, but, you know, good win for the Pats. Uh, you had the Denver Broncos beat the Jacksonville Jaguars 21-17. to Let's ride? Yeah. Par- what? Apparently the four hours of high steps might have helped. I tell you what, they did. They found a way to win, and Jacksonville is starting to come back to earth. I think they're the team that everybody thought they were going to be. Yes. Uh, you had the Atlanta Falcons beat the Carolina Panthers by the final score of 37-34 in overtime. Holy fuck, nobody wanted to win this game. Who is Atlanta? Uh, what is Atlanta? Atlanta is in first place in the NFC South. Legitimately, if you haven't seen the highlights of this game, do yourself a favor, check them out, because late in the game, uh, Carolina was down whatever the hell they were down, and then P.J. Walker, yes, folks, that's right, P.J. Walker had a Hail Mary pass to D.J. Moore, who caught the ball in the end zone, tied the game up. Beautiful pass. Gorgeous pass. Couldn't draw it up any better. You know, and then, so all oh, they're celebrating, and then DJ Moore took his helmet off, and then he got flagged. Oh. And that pushed the extra point attempt back to, like, a 42-yard attempt, mm-hmm. and Carolina missed it. So then they went to overtime, and both teams missed multiple game-winning field goals to win this damn thing uh, before you eventually had the Atlanta Falcons win it uh, super late. Like, I'm talking, like, maybe around five minutes, if not less, left in the overtime. Yeah, it, nobody wanted to win this game. It was atrocious, but you know, Atlanta found a way to win in first place in the yeah. AFC South. Yeah. I know I'm going to get some angry tweets about that, saying, "Told you we we're good. Told you." Yeah, uh, you had the Dallas Cowboys beat the Chicago Bears forty-nine to twenty-nine. Chicago, thank you for showing up. Yeah, really. Enough said. Uh, you had the Miami Dolphins beat the Detroit Lions thirty-one to twenty-seven. Detroit had them on the ropes too. Like, honest to God, man, they need I to mean, find a way to close. Did they? I mean, I'm, I'm looking at this. Uh, it was 27 to 17 at halftime. Uh, Miami came out, put up 14 points unanswered in the third quarter, and nobody did a thing in the fourth quarter. Yeah, that's the whole thing. Like, they had them on the ropes in the first quarter there. Like, I'm sorry, for them, is like you're up by 10 going into the second. And Miami didn't have a, a, a really good game going in there. Like, I'm sorry, but to what? Like, I'll give the devil his due, man. He turned it on in that second half. They did what they needed to do. But this was a, another instance where Detroit had a chance to win, could not close it, and blew another lead yet again. So that's why they're 1-6. It's a shame. Yeah, uh, 382 and 3 from Tua. Not bad. Yeah. Uh, you had the Minnesota Vikings beat the Arizona Cardinals 34-26. to Minnesota is doing it ugly. Arizona is just a bad team. Hey, Dalvin Cook finally fucking showed up. Uh, 20 carries, uh, 111 yards, one touchdown. Uh, you had the New Orleans Saints beat the Las Vegas Raiders twenty-four to nothing. Hey McDaniel's, how f- soon you want a plane ticket back to Foxborough? Oh my God, I think he's gone. I re- I legitimately think he's not going to survive the end of the season. <laughs> oh, no. I, no, he's not. If they if this keeps up, hell no. No, it's a it's the Derek Carr experiment is done. You're going to need to find a new quarterback. I'm sorry. Every, it, and it's wild because I know a lot of people, ourselves included, said Derek Carr is the weak link of that offense and, and arguably most of that team. At this point, it's so much more than just him. Yeah. Like like one week, two weeks in, okay, it's on the quarterback or maybe the offense just isn't clicking. This is week eight, week eight folks. You should have this shit figured out of how you're going to do it, what plays work, what plays don't, what to call when, what not to call. This is There's so many more issues going on here than we know. Yeah, there is just so much going on with this team that I, I'm i just puzzled watching them because on paper they should be running away with the, the division. Like, I'm sorry, like they're too talented, and yet they can't find a way to pull this off. Nope. They they just can't. And I'm sorry, the Saints aren't that good. The they're, fact that they're they, three and five. they got shut out by the Saints is, is atrocious. If I'm Josh McDaniels, I'm, i I got to be sitting there going, like, what did I do wrong? Like, you need to figure something out and figure it out fast, but I think your job is basically gone by the end of the season if this keeps up. I mean, this is a, this is a New Orleans Saints team that's only wins are against – other wins are against the Atlanta Falcons uh, and the Seattle Seahawks. So they, they got a propriety for beating teams they probably shouldn't. Uh, but, no, the Raiders, it, it's just bad. You know, their only wins are against Houston and Denver, who are both bottom of the league. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely atrocious. Uh-huh. Uh, you had the Tennessee Titans beat the Houston Texans 17-10. to 
you know, this game was ugly. Uh, Malik Willis, who was the number one draft pick for the Tennessee Titans, uh, got his first start in yeah. the NFL. So, hey, he got the W. Hey, and it helps when Derrick Henry goes for 219 and 2. Yeah. Just saying. Uh, you had the Washington Commanders. Yes, folks, that's right. The Washington Commanders. Bum, 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 bum. Uh, beat the Indianapolis Colts by the final score of 17 to 16. Uh, unsurprisingly, their offensive coordinator fired, or I'm sorry, relieved of his duties as we record today. Yeah, I don't even want to discuss this game. <laughs> it, it's real bad. It's bad. It's uh, so bad. Yeah. Uh, and then you had, last but certainly not least, the Monday night game where you had the Cleveland Browns beat the, the Cincinnati Bengals by the final score of 32 to 13. The Browns are a lot better than people thought they were. Yeah. If they just had some good luck. They're almost like the Detroit Lions in a certain degree. Kind of. Like three and five, but that team has been so talented. They're scrappy. They're, they scrap. I mean, that's the thing. But they just find ways to lose games. But this one, Amari Cooper had a great game, 131 yards and a touchdown. Nick Chubb, he was running all over the field at 101 and two touchdowns. And you can definitely tell without Jamar Chase in the lineup, the Bengals struggled. Mm-hmm. Struggled badly. Yeah. So it's going to be a long second half of the season here for Cincinnati fans. I know we talk about Super Bowl hangover, you know, for at least one team from the Super Bowl. I cannot think of the last time both teams that were in the Super Bowl had a hangover. Yeah, it's been a while. It's been a while. But it's something that they're going to definitely be dealing with, and they, I just don't see it getting any better for Cincinnati. Cleveland, though? You never know. You never know. They, there is a certain player that you're either a fan of or not a fan of coming back soon. Yeah. So all things considered, it's not looking that bad for them. No, they just got to tread water a little bit and then see if they can make yeah. a, make a big swim yeah. into that playoff pool. But that's why we watch the games each and every Sunday, Monday, and Thursday when they're on. So in the meantime, though, hit us up on that hashtag, hashtag ODPHpod. What is your thoughts about the current week of the NFL? How does your team do? Did they win? Did they lose? And what's the status of them moving forward? Let's have that discussion, shall we? We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Ooh, I've been dying to try this place. Oh my god, me too. I've heard such good things about it. Welcome to the Crime Diner. I'm Cindy. I'll be cooking for you this evening. Here are your menus. Ooh, what are you thinking about getting? I don't know, murder with a side of cannibalism? What about you? Ooh, that sounds good. I'm torn between historical mayhem and the social injustice, maybe? Oh. I just want to let you know that each episode comes with dinner, dessert, and a specialty drink chosen by yours truly. Wine Dine and Storytime has had a makeover, and we invite you to slide into the booth with us at the Crime Diner, where each week we will discuss a crime over dinner, drinks, and dessert. See you there! Coming back for another segment on this edition of the ODPH Podcast. And let's talk some pro wrestling, shall we? ooh uh. This week, the WWE has a premium live event. Oh, that just sounds weird saying. Mm-hmm. Let's just call it was Normally, it'd be called a pay-per-view, but obviously... it's I mean, technically, gone, it still is. I mean, you got to pay a service to view it, so pay-per-view. Is, this is true. So they're going to be on Peacock this Saturday from Saudi Arabia. Mm-hmm. For the annual or semi-annual... I think it's annual. The, the month changes, but they do it every year. Yeah, Crown Jewel event, which we don't really cover too much because in the years past, it's been a glorified house show. Mm-hmm. We've said this many times on the ODPH. We say this a lot of times on 6 or 7 TWS, the wrestling show. It is what it is. But this year, and you can say maybe it's the Triple H effect striking yet again, mm. there's a different buzz to this. Yes. There's a lot of hype around this. And I'm going to say it's going to be a card that we are definitely going to be wanting to check out. So, Pad, let's break it down, shall we? Yeah, so the first matchup we're going to talk about is for the tag win, WWE Women's Tag Team Championships where you've got Alexa Bliss and Asuka, the newly crowned uh, women's tag team champions, taking on damage control in Dakota Kai and EO Sky. So this is an interesting match, especially they just did a title change on Monday Night Raw. Yeah. Which I figured maybe they would save for the show. And so did I. I'm just I'm super happy that we have more than one women's match at the Crown Jewel event too. So I'm just gonna put that out yeah. there as well. Oh yeah. So this one I don't exactly know what to think. Um, I could see them flipping back to damage control. I th- I think it's gonna be a great match. I think this team, 
Uh, even though it's kind of thrown together with Alexa and Asuka, I think they got some potential to do some uh, mm-hmm. some interesting things. Uh, I guess I will say I don't doubt them flipping the titles back. I'm going to say that we'll have end new, though, because I think Damage Control is a bigger storyline right now. It'd be weird to see them flip it back and forth, but, I mean, I could see it. You know, we'll, we'll see what happens. Uh, next up is a tag team matchup for, for the undisputed WWE Tag Team Championships. We've got the Usos and Jimmy and Jay Uso defending their belts against the Brawling Brutes in Ridge Holland and Butch. Pat, you feeling very Usy? Yes. We have to talk about this before we get into the card. Uh, obviously, if you're done, if you're talking about the Usos, the amazing job Sami Zayn has done getting Usy with it. Yes. No, 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 no. Breaking characters that are just always so stone faced, yep. always just so serious in Roman Reigns and the Usos. Mm-hmm. He is doing phenomenal work. And if you haven't seen the SmackDown clip, we've been sharing it all over our social media because it's just that damn funny. And the storylines going on too with Roman Reigns and, and dealing with Jay Uso, who's not happy with Sami Zayn being in the bloodline mm-hmm. and being very frustrated and, and causing the point where he's he caused a little trouble with Roman, saying, you know, I don't give a damn about what the tribal chief thinks. And then all of a sudden, Sami Zayn has to come in there and go, I'm sorry, Roman. He's been through a lot lately. He hasn't been very Usy. <laughs> it's the comedic timing that Sami Zayn has with this group is just amazing. And I know that eventually it's going to run out. Yeah. Huh? But until then, enjoy the ride. Enjoy the ride because everything Sammy's doing here is great. Roman can't keep a straight face anytime he's on camera with nope. him. Jey Uso broke, and I, I'm not mad at him about it. I don't think anybody is because no. How, how how like how else can you describe Sammy Zayn except just amazing and just what he's he done? He got with every single member of the bloodline in one fell swoop on Friday. You know, Roman, Jimmy, Jay, Solo, and Paul Heyman all broke and laughed at the same time. Yeah. It's it's wild. Uh, that said, no disrespect to the Brawling Brutes. I don't think they're going to win this at all, and I think it's going to be the Usos to retain. Yeah, no, it's absolutely wild to see happen. So I'm definitely excited to see where they're going to go with this, and especially with the match as well, too. Mm-hmm. We have to talk about that as well because the Brawling Brutes have been definitely coming up on SmackDown and doing some really interesting things. And getting the title shot here against the Usos, I think that'll be great. Yeah. However, I don't see them walking away with the belts. No, neither do I. Uh, next up is for the, a last women's standing match for the WWE Raw Women's Championship, and you've got Bianca Belair defending her belt against Bailey. So this is going to be a great match. Yeah, it is. They've been definitely building up the storyline left and right for being a last woman standing match. I don't know, man. I want to say I think this is going to be Bailey's time. Uh, but I flip back and forth about this because I think the deal is with damage control having the belts mm-hmm. as Dakota Kai and uh, Eoskai. This is driving Bailey nuts. Mm-hmm. And I think there's a lot more storyline to be said with Bailey being the last one to not have a belt. Yeah. And I think there's some more potential and great storylines to go with this. So that said, I think you can definitely do some cool things here mm-hmm. if you if you have Bianca win. So I'm going to say Bianca retains. Okay. Uh, I'm going to say Bailey uh, wins it. Uh, okay. Just to set, set up something maybe crazy for Survivor Series, you know, with that whole uh, thing going on. We'll, mm-hmm. we'll see. Uh, next up is a singles matchup between Braun Strowman and Omos uh, with MVP. So this one is going to be the Battle of the Monsters. Uh-huh. Uh, it's a great opportunity for Omos, but I think this is all Braun Strowman now. Uh, yeah, it's it's going to be Braun. Yeah, because, I mean, obviously they want to establish him as a monster, no pun, your pun intended, on the roster that if they want to have him in a quick program with Roman Reigns, they can definitely do this after uh, Crown Jewel. So I kind of see that's where they're going with this. Uh, next up is going to be a steel cage match between Drew McIntyre and Karrion Cross. So this feud has definitely been gaining some steam. Yeah. Karrion Cross, obviously the first time he came up to the main roster, did not go well. No, to say the least. Right. And Drew McIntyre had a great run to the title match. Unfortunately, didn't cash in on it. So now him and Karrion have been putting together a great program to get Karrion Cross to a main event status, which mm-hmm. they've done splendidly. Oh, here. yeah. So this match, I think though the feud is not done yet. No, uh, I kind of go back and forth about this. That I think that they, they could end this if they want to, but I think the carrying cross gets the win by some kind of shenanigans. I'm thinking. I'm thinking there will be nefarious means that carrying cross gets the win to whether it's interference from Scarlet or whatever else it's going to be. It's probably going to be something from Scarlet. Let's be real. Yeah. Um. Uh, but no, I, th- I think Carrie's Carrie's going to get the win, but it won't be uh, neat and tidy. No, it definitely won't be. Uh, next up in a singles matchup, you have Brock Lesnar taking on Bobby Lashley. The match we've all been waiting for. For like six years now? 
something like it's that. It's been an insane amount of time that obviously with Lesnar and Lashley's MMA backgrounds, mm-hmm. to see them finally get together in the squared circle and really have a match, this is going to be exciting. The buildup has been interesting because Brock came out of nowhere yeah. to just challenge Lashley and then been yeah. setting up very nicely. I think Lashley wins this outright. I think so. I think there's no chance he takes the L here. I I think this would – the only way I could see this going is if, if – Lesnar loses, and they're going to do this back at Survivor Series. Sure, like he can't handle the fact he lost. Sure, like he goes like sure. complete uh, sore loser and goes could, into the heel mode. So definitely could see that playing out. I could see it. I mean, I think what would be wild to see a finish is because I think Lashley's going to win. Would be to see Lesnar tr- go to suplex Lashley, and then Lashley turn it into the hurt lock. Yeah, that could definitely happen. Which as would well. be wild to see. I'd, I'd be down for that. Yes. Uh, next up is a six man tag team matchup between the OC uh, with AJ Styles, Luke Gallows, and Carl Anderson taking on the Judgment Day uh, with Finn Balor, Damian Priest, and Dominic Mysterio. So this feud has been gaining some steam, obviously, with Carl Anderson and Luke Gallows coming back to the WWE and reforming the Bullet Club, mm-hmm. but we can't say Bullet Club with AJ Styles. It's a very telling story that they have going on because with Finn Balor's faction of Damian Priest and Ray Ripley now adding Dominic Mysterio to it, uh, it really hasn't given a lot of sizzle with Dominic involved, but everybody else has been really building this up into something fun. I do think this is going to be the match at Wall Games. Uh, but I think for this match, Ray Mysterio comes in and helps his son win reluctantly because he can't handle the fact that he's away from his, his son who's getting corrupted by the Judgment Day. So inadvertently, he cost the the club the match in this. This sure. for wall games. That's could, the way I take it. I could see it. Uh, I also uh, listen. I'm going to throw a real wild curveball here, real left field curveball here. Follow me though. Okay. I think it'll be OC win, but you, the one one you know unknown factor you're going to have in the outside is uh, the one, the only Rhea Ripley, who's mm. been causing absolute havoc and absolute mayhem. Uh, at ringside. She's the MVP of that She's faction. She's the MVP of that faction. What if, what if, and I apologize, I forget the gentleman's name, but whoever the hell, uh, or no, fuck, this won't work. I was going to say, what if the guy uh, Anderson's supposed to face for the Never Open Championship shows up and helps out, but they're, those shows are booked the same day. Fuck. Yeah, no, that wouldn't happen. That would be amazing if they want to try doing it because there's been a lot of forbidden door stuff happening yeah. lately. So yeah. So I, I wouldn't Doubt. I for, I was going to pitch that whole idea, and then I remembered, oh, wait. Yeah, Tomatonga is not wrestling. Well, no, it's it's whoever he's supposed to face for the Never Open Championship. Uh, that's like, oh, no, don't worry. Don't strip him. I'll wait. Um, they're running a show that day, though. Fuck. No, well, never mind. Uh, I think it's going to end up being Judgment Day. It definitely could be. So I I think that's the only way you do the storyline, because then you're going to build a wall games and then really go some places with yeah. it. Uh, and then in the main event, uh, in a singles matchup for the WWE Undisputed Champion Universal Championship, you have Roman Reigns defending his belt against Logan Paul. So this definitely got the internet's attention. Yeah. Got a lot of pop, pop culture's attention. Yeah. Logan Paul, social media influencer, podcaster. Yep. Um, say what you will about him. There's a lot that can be said. Good and bad. Yep. Uh, very polarizing figure. Is now signed to WWE. Yep. He's had two matches, and he was booked to face Roman Reigns Mm -hmm. in a storyline that kind of spawned out of their podcast, too. uh, Yeah. Impulsive. So this has been an interesting build for it. Yeah. Um, Logan Paul is very, very good, but he's had good dance partners. Mm Mm-hmm. Roman Reigns is the best in the business right now. He is the draw. He is on a needle mover. He's on a different level than everybody else. This is going to be a fun match. Oh, yeah. But I think if you think Logan Paul is winning the belt over Roman, I think you're a little crazy at this stage. It's it's fun to entertain. But, yeah. You know, is it realistically going to happen? No. No, absolutely not. So that said, I am going to say Roman wins this outright. I don't think anybody has anything to worry about. I think Logan will reappear at some point, but yeah. this feud is one and done. Yeah, no, it'll be a good match. It'll be a decently long match. I don't think it'll be the longest matchup of the night, but I, it'll be a good match. And I think it's going to be Roman to retain just because... I forget the exact number, but I think once if if he carries this belt up to Mania, he'll be at or near like a thousand days. Mm-hmm. 
I don't think they're taking the belt off him anytime until Mania, you know. So it's it's just hey, it's it's another person to feed to Roman that he hasn't faced before, you know. And it, and it's a it's a fresh look. Logan, I think, is going to put up a fight, and I think he's getting some great training because it's been uh, documented and, and shown in videos that he's been training with uh, Shawn Michaels. Yeah, you know, which hey, hell of a person to learn from, gotta say, you know. But I and, and so I think that training and, and tutelage will pay off in a good match. But ultimately, at the end of the day, it's going to be Roman's world. Definitely is. So overall, I mean, it looks like a fun card on paper. Uh, the other thing, too, is they announced on Raw last night that making an appearance, and it's not listed here because he doesn't have a match, but he'll be making an appearance, is Bray Wyatt. No, well, that'll be interesting. Uh-huh. It'll be fun to see him address the crowd. I wonder what the reaction is going to be because, obviously, uh, I know he's introducing, what, Uncle Howie? Uncle Howie, which I do not think that's him under that mask. I don't either. I think it's a certain uh, familial relation of his. That's rumored to be coming back. It could be, but it makes sense. I mean, if you're not sure who it is, all you have to do is believe. Interesting. I could see that happen if that's him, but because it, I, I realized they used like a voice modulator to hide the voice, but even just listening to it a couple of times, it did not sound like Bray. No, it definitely didn't. But that's the one great thing about that character right now. Bray Wyatt's doing all these crazy vignettes, and they're making sense. And the, you know, the thing is, just enjoy being a fan and yeah. you know, seeing what it all plays out. I'm not expecting too much big things happening at the pay, at the uh, premium no, event with Bray. Good matches, but not, you know, earth shattering. Like, oh my god, five star match, the greatest match of all time. No, nah, probably not. No, but they do have some very quality matches. So it'll be something to check out this Saturday on the Peacock Network. So you definitely want to stay tuned if you're a wrestling fan for that. In the meantime, though, hit us up on that hashtag, hashtag ODPHPod. What is your thoughts about WWE Crown Jewel? Are you excited for the event? Are you not, and why? And if you want even more pro wrestling content, make sure to check out 607 TWS, the wrestling show on your favorite podcast provider, and at ODPHPodcast.com. Blogs count anywhere. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. So 2021 is upon us, and instead of flying cars and monkey robot butlers, we have a pandemic. We have media and making every little annoying twit of a child think they're going to be the next famous celebrity because they did some stupid trend they've seen somebody else doing nine million times we have people that are self-entitled and stupid and given a voice through social media constantly whining about how everybody else is the problem and how everyone else needs to fix things we have celebrities lecturing us about how we have to give more so we can elevate everyone to a better life from the security of their seven bedroom multi-million dollar estates we have politicians lying to us that they're going to fix the situations we're in that they created in the first place and then we've got me having the conversations that a lot of us are thinking but nobody's talking about because these things have to be said i had to say at the podcast Available wherever you get your podcast fix or at www.ihadtosayapodcast.com. Why don't you come listen to what I've got to say. Coming back for another segment on this edition of the ODPH Podcast. And there has been some noise as we are recording Mm -hmm. that we can't turn away from. We need to address. Mm -hmm. And that is Brooklyn is going Brooklyn. (laughs) Yeah, they are. Pad... How would you define the latest events going on there? Train wreck, garbage, uh, dumpster fire. Uh, you know, somebody took a bag of dog shit, lit it on fire, and left it on my front porch. It like I I always expected, just given the the history and the track record with this team, something would happen. Mm-hmm. It, you know, it's a matter of if, not when. Uh, you know, or sorry, it's a matter of when, not if. You know, but I never expected it to be this soon into the season. No, it's definitely been an interesting season because in case you're not familiar, the Brooklyn Nets are slated to be Eastern Conference Finals contenders with an all-star cast of Kevin Durant, Kyrie Irving, Ben Simmons. However, since they have formed in Brooklyn, it has been nothing but drama and turmoil. Mm -hmm. Let's face it, last season. And empty promises. And empty promises because obviously when it was so hyped that Kyrie and KD were coming, that everybody was penciling them in to get not one, not two, not three, but four championships. You, or... you even had some people saying, you know, they're the team in New York now. Because mm-hmm. let's not forget, in case you don't know, uh, Brooklyn is one of the five boroughs in New York City. This is true. And since they've been there, it has not gone exactly the way they have wanted. Now, admittedly, you know, that first year, Kevin Durant did miss that first year because he was recovering from the injury he had suffered in the NBA Finals the previous year. So. Mm. Asterisk that season, you know, not entirely his fault. 
No, you have to give that asterisk there. But since that point, it has been nothing but drama there that Kevin Durant has came back to an all-star mm-hmm. prominence. However, Kyrie Irving's drama has oh, oh, been Jesus. nothing short of just insane to watch as yeah. a fan. And killing a locker room slowly. Mm-hmm. With each time there's an incident where he doesn't show up, oh, that there is numerous reasons for why he's not playing, injuries, you name it. It's it's the stuff that he can control has been been more detrimental than the injuries because injuries happen all the time. Oh yeah, and I can't believe I'm saying this. I long for the days when he was walking through the garden, spreading what was it, burning sage mm-hmm. or whatever it was, where that was the weirdest thing. Yeah, like that feels like a lifetime ago, and I miss those days. Oh, I absolutely do because at this at this point, he's now just pushing the envelope of just yeah just insanity in my opinion like i'm sorry everything that he's been doing lately has just been out of control and especially Mm -hmm. he's been promoting a anti-semitic film yeah on his social media which is just disgusting and egregious it's it's abhorrent to say the least yeah and and every when he's been getting called out for it he he's like no i've been promoting it but what's the big deal yeah it was just been the big deal and especially how just utterly horrific that is. And, and tone deaf. Yeah. And just obviously when you're sharing something on your social media, you are promoting. Mm-hmm. So you can't use that excuse. And when he's been called upon this, it's turned into a, just a media circus in its own right. And this, unfortunately, is just another case of Kyrie being Kyrie yeah. in Brooklyn. That well, well, And the other thing, too, is you can't sit there and say... Oh, the, you know, this isn't really his fault. This is him getting shown something and, and believing in it. No, this is a fully fucking grown man. Yeah. Like, the, you've got to stop coddling him and making excuses for this guy because this isn't, you know, some rookie who just got drafted out of Gonzaga mm-hmm. or, or some nonsense that, like, oh, they're innocent. They don't really know. They're just kind of coming up and they're they're getting used to the exposure. He's He's over 30 years old. You know, he's he's approaching 30, however old he is. Mm-hmm. He's been in the league for like 11, 12 years. These are fully formulated thoughts and opinions he has. He's just now taking the time to express them outwardly. Yeah. So, the, so to sit there and, and coddle him and baby him and make excuses is not helping matters. It's in it's enhancing the, uh, the problem. Yeah. It is a situation that is just getting worse by the day and obviously the play of the team is not helping matters no. as they're two and five out of the gate and is just been turmoil after turmoil there. We now see that they have made a change in the coaching uh, ranks as Steve Nash has been relieved of his duties. Uh-huh. Yeah, reading from an article on ESPN.com, it reads, quote, Steve Nash is out as head coach of the Brooklyn Nets. The team announced Tuesday. The decision to part ways was mutual between the Nets and Nash, sources told ESPN's Adrian Wojnarowski. Quote, we want to thank Steve for everything he brought to our franchise over the past two seasons, General Manager Sean Marks said in a statement Tuesday. Since becoming head coach, Steve was faced with a number of unprecedented challenges, and we are sincerely grateful for his leadership, patience, and humility throughout his tenure. Personally, this was an immensely difficult decision. However, after much deliberation and evaluation of how the season has begun, we agree that a change we agreed that a change is necessary at this time, close quote. In a separate statement, Nash thanked Marks and the team ownership for quote an amazing experience with many challenges that I'm incredibly grateful for, close quote. Well, we all knew this had to happen. Steve Nash has yeah. been over his head for quite some time as the head yeah. coach of the Nets. Yeah. They're not getting any better with him. Uh, no. Getting swept out of the playoffs first round by Boston last season did not help matters. Wait, I'm sorry. What happened in the playoffs last oh, year? Oh, they were swept first round. Okay. By Boston. Yeah. Which ironically is now coming back to haunt them a little mm. bit. Because as it's being widely rumored to be happening, suspended Boston head coach Ime Odoka mm-hmm. is going to become the new head coach of the Brooklyn Nets. Yeah, so uh, reading from the same ESPN article, it says, quote, suspended Boston Celtics coach Ime Udoka has emerged as the likely next Nets head coach, and his hiring could be finalized as soon as the next 24 to 48 hours, sources told ESPN's Adrian Wojnarowski. The Celtics would let uh, Udoka leave for another job, sources said. The hope is that Udoka could can tighten the nets defensively and commend the respect of the franchise's key players. Udoka spent a season on Nash's staff before accepting the Celtics job and winning the Eastern Conference. Udoka's time in Boston was essentially over after being given a one-year suspension for having an improper workplace relationship with a female subordinate. Close quote. 
Yeah, so this is just getting crazier by the day. Oh, and for what it's worth, assistant coach Jacques Vaughn will be the acting head coach for uh, Tuesday night's home game against the Chicago Bulls. <sighs> Thoughts on this, Pat? Well, I mean, listen, I respect Steve Nash as a player. Mm-hmm. You know, he is one of the best point guards to have ever played the game. You know, not the best, but he's in the, he's in the conversation. I do do I feel sorry for him for getting put in this position because could he make a good head coach? I think so. I, I think it's some of the coaches he's been around during his tenure and some of the players he's had the opportunity to play with lend him a very good basketball knowledge that would translate very well to being a head coach. That said, I would not in a million years, I even before all this bullshit with Kyrie and Durant and Harden and Ben Simmons and everybody else, I would not have put them him in this situation because this is a lose lose situation because he was going into this with no head coaching experience at any level mm-hmm. outside of maybe a pickup basketball game for his kids. Yeah. You know, in any sort of organized, you know, basketball game at any level, you know, from the lowest to the highest, he never coached. So to take an unknown rookie in every sense of the word head coach and put him in an NBA level job with personalities like James Harden, like Kevin Durant, Kyrie Irving, Ben Simmons, and everybody else on that team was a recipe for failure. And I, and I honestly feel bad for the guy. And I'm excited to see where he goes for his next venture because I really honestly think, and do I think he's going to go down as the best head coach of all time? No. Do I think he can be a good head coach? Absolutely. Given the right circumstances and someone that isn't in the limelight and the absolute fucking nine ring circus. That's right, folks. It's not a three ring circus. This shit's a nine ring circus that is the Brooklyn Nets. It's a situation that he was handpicked by Kevin Durant and Kyrie to run that team. Uh huh. Like the inmates are running the asylum in Brooklyn, and that's kind of the overall theme where we're going with this segment is that they have been given everything they wanted and they still can't win. Uh huh. And for Steve Nash. He's coming into this with no coaching experience, like I yep, said, yep. former MVP of the league. And so he does know the game of basketball, but that doesn't yeah. exactly translate to coaching, yeah. especially coaching or coaching millionaires that have these kind of egos yeah. that are distractions to your team left and right. Well, and then let's just run through the whole thing with Steve, Steve Nash. You know, the former head coach was there, you know, Durant and Kyrie and Kyrie wanted him gone. They got rid the ownership, got rid of him, they brought in Steve Nash. And then they wanted James Harden. So then they got James Harden. Well, then it wasn't working with James Harden. So they got rid of James Harden. And then they got Ben Simmons. And we'll see what's going on with Ben Simmons. Shocking to no one. He's got another knee knee injury that's bothering him. So yeah. fucking shocker to no one there. But now things weren't working with Steve Nash. And, and now Steve Nash took the fall. At some point, you got to stop looking at all the other outlets for this you know, organization and start looking at maybe it's the players. Mm-hmm. You know, you've gone through two head coaches now. You've rotated a whole bunch of other, you know, additional pieces in and out of there. Maybe it's time you start looking at some of your key guys and going, maybe the bet we hedged everything on isn't the right one. No, Joe Sy, who runs the Brooklyn Nets, needs to come out there and definitely take charge of this team. And he hasn't done that yet. No. And unfortunately, I just don't see it happening with him with all the drama they've had. Like I say, when you've had players that are just completely running crazy Mm -hmm. on your team, demanding trade requests remember they wanted james yeah. harden couldn't work there so they yeah. brought in ben simmons didn't work there he's obviously got his own issues going on mm-hmm. it, you have to look at that team and go okay what's the problem and then i think the, the glaring problem right now is Kyrie. yeah that his outside the court antics are definitely getting worse mm-hmm. the latest thing about the anti-semitic film that he was sharing them on social media. Like, I'm sorry. Like you can't sit there and just say, okay, don't do this next time, you know, and, and don't come down with any consequences. Yeah. If they haven't disciplined him before. Why would they start now? Exactly. That's the problem that he has. So he, so he knows he can literally get away with anything and they won't punish him for it. Mm-hmm. So bringing in a new head coach is not going to exactly right the ship. Cause I don't really know what Adoka is going to do to get him back on track. I'd bench him. Yeah, well, that's the thing. You have to. I'd, I'd outright release Kyrie. Oh, I would too. But if if that's not an option for whatever reason, you know, because I don't run the Nets front office, mm-hmm. I'd bench him for a week. You you really want to be opinionated and you want to cause detriment and you know conduct detrimental. You know, the, you hear that all the time with the NFL. You know, oh, suspended for conduct detrimental to the team. Mm-hmm. I think this would apply. 
you know, you've got players on that team that rather than answering what they got to do for the Chicago Bulls coming up tonight are having to answer about Kyrie's bullshit. And I know Bomani Jones brought it up on first take this morning. You know, waving him makes the most sense if you don't want to hold on to him and you just want to start fresh. Because is Kyrie good? Yes. Mm-hmm. Let, let's not get it twisted. Our opinions aside, Kyrie is a good player. He's He's a great player. But under normal circumstances, could you get some trade value for him? Absolutely. But given this level of bullshit, no, you'd get nothing back from him. And I don't think, you know, it's like Bomani Jones said, I don't think there's a line of teams that are willing to give up anything for Kyrie at this point, given the headache. Because it's not a question of, oh, you know, when's it gonna, when's the next thing going to drop? It's a matter of, you know, it's going to happen. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and it's not like you can sit there and wait for this to blow over for the trade value to go to go back up because by the time you, your trade value starts to go up there's some other shit that's going to come down the pike he's going to want to take a week off and and go party with his sister for her birthday or take some mental break and not want to play for three weeks or some shit it's it's always something yeah i mean i think you gotta go stronger than that i mean suspending for a week is almost like playing right into his hand because you know he likes to take time off like I'm sorry, just the track record's there, folks. Mm-hmm. That he takes off time for Y pad reasons. reasons. And like I say, but coming down from the social media share that he did, I believe it was on Twitter. It was. Yeah, I'm sorry. Like the fact that this is going on and you're not coming down with a harder punishment on him about this, in my mm-hmm. opinion, I think is, is egregious. And I think this is where you really need to step up. If you're taking control of your team, the Nets need to do something. Well, the only issue I can see with the suspension and coming down harder on him is we do have to remember he is, I believe, the vice president of the NBA Players Association. Yeah. So anything that is done to him, he will have the full backing of the Players Association. Yeah. So I mean, that that's the one like little wrench getting thrown into things that might be hindering the Nets on doing something is whatever they do to him, the union's going to fight him on it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just a messy situation, but bringing it back tenfold, though. A new head coach in there, and especially one with as much controversy as Adoka has, I don't know if that's exactly what you want to bring into Brooklyn right now. No. I really don't. I think that that whole situation of you know his suspension in Boston is just absolutely just not something that you need with the it's team. It's adding more fuel to the fire. Yeah, exactly. Like It's just going to be puzzling to see how this pans out. I still think with Adoka, they're, they're not going to get to the finals. I think they're going to have no. problems. Because I think, unfortunately, you're now showing that the inmates are running the asylum. So unless he does something drastic to, to bring everybody back into playing basketball and cutting off the the, out, the off-court nonsense, it's not going to get changed. It's not going to get better. Say, so, hell, Mark Jackson, I think, makes more sense to me than Udoka does. Don't get me wrong, Udoka's good. But just given the current s- scenario and situation surrounding him, that, like I said, you're, you're just pouring gasoline onto that fire. Yeah, no, Mark Jackson would have been a much better hire. And definitely he would have gotten in their faces and... He would have been somebody that I think would have been actually. Tough love. Yeah, but that's what they need down there. So unless Adoka is going to do something there, it's not going to pan out because unfortunately with how that roster is set up, I mean, KD, remember, he wanted out of there in the worst way in the offseason. Yeah, he did. So did Kyrie, and then all of a sudden we're going to work together. We're going to make it happen, blah, blah, blah. I'm sorry, just to, to kind of bookend it a little bit, the situation is you made a change, but is it one for the better? And I think unfortunately until you get your players – disciplined and ready to go onto the court every game, it's not going to get better. Because if they're having this nonsense off the court, it's only going to bring more drama to your team. Mm -hmm. And you're getting away from why you're there, and that's to play basketball and win games. Until Brooklyn figures this out, it doesn't matter who you have as head coach. When you stop bringing the drama there, then it will start making some sense. That said, hit us up on that hashtag, hashtag ODPHpod. What is your thoughts about the media circus that is the Brooklyn Nets? Do you love the coaching hire they just made? Do you not? What's your thoughts about Steve Nash leaving? And what's your thoughts about Kyrie and the drama that he's bringing to the team? Is this the final straw for him in Brooklyn? Let's discuss, shall we? We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. This is Tom from Tom Joe Lou. This is Matt from Sideroom Sounds. And you're listening to ODPH Podcast. Wanna go where no one knows my name To the desert, the oceans, or the plains Cause I wanna... Coming back for the final segment of this edition of the ODPH Podcast. Pad, what you got? Got a couple things to talk about. Uh, the first of which is the local minute. Uh, looking at the Binghamton Black Bears from this uh, past weekend of, uh, of games, they had two against the Danbury Hattricks on the road. Uh, they lost both games. Uh, the first one on Friday by the final score of 5-1. to one. Uh, and then Saturday, they lost by the final score of 5-4 to four in overtime. 
Uh, looking at their schedule for this upcoming week, they are on the road again, uh, this time Friday, November 4th, 7.35 p.m. Eastern. Uh, they are on the road at Elmira playing the Mammoth, uh, and then they're back again on Saturday, this time at 6.35 p.m. Eastern uh, playing the Elmira Mammoth. However, they do return home for a two-game homestand the following weekend, uh, that being uh, November 11th and 12th. Uh, for more tickets and information and all that good stuff, BinghamtonBlackBears.com. Uh, and then we got to talk a little NASCAR. Yeah, we do. Yeah, we do, because this is fucking wild. Now, admittedly, I used to watch NASCAR when I was a kid, and, you know, I, I really liked the wrecks, and then I kind of got into it. I watched from probably 2001 through, like, 2011, 2012, somewhere in there. Um, you know, so it's been a while since I watched, just because I'm usually working Sundays and NFL's on and all that. But we got sent, you know, a video from uh, Multiverse of Badness. Shout out to Mike. You know, which, hey, you guys got to check this out. And I'll, I'll admit, in the 10 years, you know, I had watched NASCAR. Hell, I played NASCAR video games. I never considered doing this shit. No. You had a, a driver by the name of Ross Chastain. So the thing going on with NASCAR is they are in their playoffs. You know, they're approaching the end of their season where a championship will be held. And the way their playoff system works is you get points and, you know, you a certain number qualify. And then every so num- so many weeks... I don't know how many it is, but like after so many weeks, a certain number are eliminated. And eventually what it gets down to is you get to the final four, you know, and those guys can each win and have a shot at winning the championship. Well, you had this race uh, took place at Martinsville in Virginia, Mm. where the now bear in mind, if if you get a chance, pause this Google search Martinsville racetrack map just to see the layout of this track. This is not, you know, the Daytonas or the Talladegas where they're going to go 200 miles an hour and really really open it up and go nuts. This is one of the slower ones. It's more the you know, you got to slow down to go into the curves. You really got to finesse and be kind of picky and choosy with your lot of strategy involved. Uh, But. This driver by the name of Ross Chastain was in the hunt to make it into what they call the transfer, a.k.a. you make it on to the next uh, round of the playoffs. He just needed a couple more spaces, and unfortunately, one of the drivers uh, was ahead of him that he needed to beat this guy to make it into the next round of the championships. Well, Ross Chastain decided to say, fuck it. And when he went in, came coming out of the back stretch into turns three and four, decided to hug the wall, floor the goddamn thing, not take his foot off the gas, not put it on the brake, and basically pass I don't know how many cars. He passed probably about an even dozen cars. It was something insane. But in doing so, he passed the necessary cars he needed to do to make it into the next uh, next round of the playoffs. And knocked out one of the other drivers. And if you haven't seen it, there's a video floating around. I know I've seen it on Facebook. You can probably, I think it's on Twitter too, but it's a compilation of some of the radio calls from other drivers and their spotters. Mm-hmm. Of like, And none of them can believe what they just saw. Like I said, I watch NASCAR every week for probably about 10 years. I never saw any shit like this. I, I've played NASCAR video games with my brother when we were kids. We never tried anything like this. This is it, I don't know where he thought of this or how long he's been sitting on this move, but kudos to you, sir. That was the damnedest thing I've ever seen, and it was incredible. I legitimately was ready to pop in Molly Hatch at Flirting with Disaster. <laughs> like, as I was watching this, like, this took me back when Mike sent this over. Shout out to him. I, I was like, what the hell? Like, this is a video game move, mm-hmm. like, in real life, and especially with how fast NASCAR cars go oh yeah like what the hell is wrong with you man but my god this yeah. works oh it does it's it's insane i mean some estimates um you know had him going at like 120 miles an hour while all the other guys are going through the turn at 60 yeah it's absolutely wild to see if you can find this video footage yeah like i'm, it's sh- I'm like insane I'm, I'm showing ken there's a video because all we've seen are like the broadcast videos but this is a video from someone in who was in the stands and you just watch and you just see how much faster he's going than everybody else yeah. It's fucking insane. Yeah, I mean, ice cold water in that man's veins, but uh-huh. my God. Kudos to you, sir. You, you gambled, and it paid off, and I, and I know the right side of his car is all torn to shreds. It, little no fact, folks, if you don't watch NASCAR, don't worry. They got others. Yeah, they got others. They, so got, they got other cars. He'll be fine, but man, that is just a point that you say I played way too many video games. Yeah, uh-huh. At least, you know, like I say, I... I, I'm still astonished watching that that he did not do more damage to himself. I'm I'm, I'm thankful he didn't. But yeah, no, that was wild. That was absolutely insane. Uh, on my end, a couple of quick wrestling notes to talk about. 
This week's AEW Dynamite, really a solid card going into building up a little more for full gear that's coming on November 19th. John Moxley's taking on Lee Moriarty. Chris Jericho's taking on a former ROH champion that's been undisclosed. Uh, apparently, it does not matter if it's a world champion anymore, Pat. It could be a TV champ, could be a pure champ, huh. could be a tag team champion. Interesting. Like, he's now declared war. Except now I'm, I'm taking more offense that he's trademarked the Ocho. I know. We might have to talk to our lawyers. Yeah, we got to talk to him about this. Like, if he's if he drops an Ocho Duro on air, man, I'm going to be laying into him on well, social Listen well, here, Jericho, if that is your real name. Yeah. Lawyer up, motherfucker. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Or if you just want to come on the podcast, like you can do this. And, you Anyone know, got the number for Bob Odenkirk? Yeah. <laughs> well played, Pad. Well played. Jennifer Walters, maybe? Hey, we need we might need that for the court there to explain. Can you imagine that just sitting in Chris Jericho arguing about this? Charlie Cox, hello? Yeah. We're just gonna trademark like uh, I, well, I'm trying to think. He has so many nicknames. It's tough he to does. T- keep track of. But he does. It'll be still fun to watch him on AEW Dynamite along with the rest of the stars. So it's a pretty solid card those, this Wednesday. Uh, so definitely make sure you're watching that on TBS Network, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. But that's not the big wrestling news. The one that shook me up this morning, shook Rich from 3FN up this morning. And if you're into independent pro wrestling, this should be shaking you up. Okay. It was announced this morning that Game Changer Wrestling, GCW, has joined Fight TV. And mm. this is now going to be, a like I say, when you talk about Game Changer moments, this is a big deal. Now, I know you're probably saying if you're familiar with GCW, oh, well, they always show their pay-per-views on, GC, or on Fight TV. That's nothing new, Ken. What are you talking about? Well, it's not exactly that. They have signed a deal with Fight TV Plus. So what this means is four ninety nine per month. Okay. According to the graphic, you get access to everything GCW for one monthly price. Okay. Live events, uh-huh. which is you can watch GCW every GCW event streamed around the world. Nice. The full GCW library. Ooh. Which is worth it alone. I'll say for four ninety nine. That's a good deal. This is a huge deal, yeah. and, and you can get a lot of other pro wrestling. On Fight Plus, I know Glory Pro Wrestling just went there as well. This is worth it uh, on so many different levels. Like the GCW pay per views are relatively cheap to begin with, like for what you get because they offer uh, bundle packages. This is huge. If you have never checked out GCW, this is a perfect time to sign up for it. And they're going to be starting this with November twelfth, Nick Gage Invitational. Now, I will say this: if you're not familiar with GCW, this might not be the event you want to start with because this is a deathmatch tournament. So if you're not into deathmatch wrestling, you might want to wait till the next one to watch. Right. However, this is well worth it for the library. GCW is the biggest independent uh, pro wrestling uh, company right now in North America. So you definitely want to get on board. And for the price, like I say, four ninety nine a month includes every single GCW event. And if you get to watch the live events too, that's huge. Like this is game changing, pun intended. But I tell you what, you want to go check this out at Fight TV. So make sure to swing on over there. Fight.tv. Sign up today. Tell them the ODPH sent you. Tell them six or seven TWS sent you. So tell them 3FN sent you because you know we all endorse it there. It's well worth it. So make sure to sign up. We'll be talking about this in more weeks to come. That being said, Pad, we'll keep it very short and sweet for anything and everything that is the ODPH. You can find it at ODPHpodcast.com. That's all for this week. So for the one and only, Padawan J. For real, though. Fuck the Astros. I'm your host, Ken M. Thank you, as always, for listening to the ODPH Podcast, better known as the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour. See you next time. Cause I can't bring me